Hello, and welcome to Latter-day Saint Home Educators Wednesday webinar series. LDSHE is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to support, strengthen, and inspire Latter-day Saint families in home education. We've been putting on conferences that gather hundreds of LDS homeschoolers from across the country since 2004. Today's presentation is one of many classes originally prepared to be presented live at the 2020 LDSHE Homeschool Conference. Our physical conference has been canceled due to coronavirus concerns, so we are embracing our theme, Trust the Journey, and moving forward with this online conference. We hope you'll find motivation, inspiration, and encouragement in today's presentation. A few housekeeping items before we begin. At the end of the webinar, our speaker will answer questions. If you have a question you would like to ask, please type it in the chat box where it will be recorded by the facilitator and passed on to the presenter during the question and answer at the end of the presentation. Replays of these webinars will be available on the Latter-day Saint Home Educators Facebook page. They'll also be on our YouTube channel and website, ldshe.org, by the Friday after this live webinar airs. These webinars will be happening every Wednesday until May 20th, at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern. Again, we welcome you to the LDSHE Wednesday webinar series. Thanks for being here. We'll turn our time now to David Handy and his class on Seek Scientific Knowledge by Study and also by Faith. Well, thank you, Lisa. Really glad to be here with all my homeschool friends and, and uh, other family members. Um, and uh, so grateful to be speaking about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I hope that as part of this uh, conversation, we'll come away, all of us, uh, more inspired and more motivated in our seek for, seeking for scientific knowledge. The title of my talk comes from a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants. And as all not have faith, seek ye diligently and teach one another words of wisdom Yea, seek ye out of the best books, words of wisdom. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. So this indicates two paths to knowledge, study and faith. And we'll be talking about that in this uh, presentation. But first, a little bit about me. I'm a homeschooling dad. Very proud father of four children whom we homeschooled from the beginning. I am a science and technology nerd. You cannot keep me away from that stuff. And I am an enthusiastic and grateful follower of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I try to make him the center of my life in everything I do, including studying science. I've got 10 years experience. This past 10 years have been wonderful. Every year, uh, teaching a different uh, science topic to a group of homeschoolers, uh, homeschool co-op meeting in our home. And the way we ran it is that, uh, they would study on their own from a textbook uh, during the week and then one day a week they'd they'd meet in our home for about an hour and a half to do to uh, discussions and lab work together a lot of good memories uh, this is my science teaching notebook it is battle scarred just like a, a fighter pilot's airplane where he paints a little symbol on the airplane for each victory. I've got listed here each uh, science class I taught this past uh, 10 years. You might notice I've taught chemistry three times and biology twice. And also uh, with my wife, uh, we, we taught um, anatomy classes twice. Also, I teach computer programming to anyone who doesn't run fast enough to escape from me first. Uh, I believe that computer programming is very important for, for everyone to learn. Uh, we are moving into the age of self-driving cars. And in the next couple of decades, all the best jobs are going to go to people who can code. Uh, I recommend Python as the beginning computer programming language. Um, I actually wrote a beginning computer programming book. This is uh, a picture of its cover that you see here. It is currently out of print because I am heavily revising it. it be, I actually wrote this back like in 2004, 2006, and uh, the world has changed quite a bit since then. So I've been revising that as I've been going over it with our youngest child, Melody, who has been perhaps my best student yet. 
I can't stop doing math, seriously. Like for fun, I will write computer programs to solve systems of uh, coupled, tightly coupled differential equations. This is a little page from one of my electronic notebooks. I can't stop creating simulations. This is an animation of one of the uh, physics simulations that I did a couple years back of a system of, of this is what I used the, the program to solve coupled differential equations to do is to simulate the behavior of masses and springs linked together. I can't stop doing experiments. Uh, my current uh, experiment that I'm working on now, uh, I just didn't feel like taking for granted the, the um, measurements uh, uh, of acceleration of gravity. I wanted to measure it for myself. So I've been building an apparatus to do that. Uh, over on the left-hand side here, see this is a PVC pipe and I have embedded into it three photosensors, an infrared LED um, on one side and a phototransistor on the other side. And that's hooked up to a microcontroller, which I programmed to measure the time at which a falling object falling through the tube passes to an accuracy of approximately three microseconds. In the lower right-hand corner, you see here's a graph of my results so far, which are not satisfactory. I'm, I'm working on you know, improving the accuracy of this device. But this is what I do for fun um, in my spare time. Uh, enough about me, let's talk about science. Uh, let's talk about what is science? Why should you learn science? What's the connection between God and science? Uh, I would like to share with you, uh, and also what are the different kinds of science is very important to distinguish between good and bad science. I'm going to share with you some success stories of young scientists. Along the way, I'll convince you that science is for people who are not scientists. And uh, I have to talk about the amazing miracle of life and creation. And uh, finally, at the end, some career advice. First off, science is not guys in white lab coats looking at microscopes. It doesn't have to be someone with a PhD or a government grant or like really genius smart people. Science is simply nothing more, nothing less than the disciplined pursuit of truth by means of the scientific method. I'm gonna explain a little bit about truth and the scientific method here. Truth is reality. It's a knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. The scientific method includes controlled experiments, record keeping, peer review, reproducible results. That means somebody else can do it and they get the same results and logical analysis using mathematics. Science is for followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus knows everything. And he said, come follow me. If we want to be more like our savior, we should study science. Everyone is a scientist in real life. A uh, quote from a book I'm currently reading um, by a biochemist. We are all careful observers of our world. We all make mental notes of what we observe. We all use these notes to build conceptual models of how things work. And we all continually refine these models as needed. Without a doubt, this is science. And then I'll give two examples. Cooking. Okay, do you remember I said, keep records, uh, reproducible results? What do you think a recipe is? It's a, it's a written record of how you perform the experiment in such a way that someone else can reproduce those same results. You make careful measurements and you refine those. And uh, peer review, that's when you say, hey, little brother, try these cookies and tell me what you think. Another example is family history research that I know that many of you are doing. Uh, comparing two records and trying to deduce whether they're referring to the same person or a different person, looking carefully and comparing dates, dates of birth, marriage, death, births of children, all those things, using uh, detailed scholarly methods, even if you don't realize it. All of you are scientists in your own way. But I'm not smart enough, I've heard. One of the saddest things I've heard is when a homeschooler, or especially their parents, tell me, I'm no good at this. 
or I'm dumb or things like that. You must understand that intelligence is not something that's unchanging and fixed at birth. Uh, Khan Academy, on the Khan Academy website, it says, most people are held back, not by their innate ability, but by their mindset. They think intelligence is fixed, but it isn't. Your brain is like a muscle. The more you use it and struggle, the more it grows. Saying you're not smart enough to do science is saying that you're too, like saying you're too weak to exercise. That's not how it works. You do science in order to get smarter. But that sounds like hard work. <laughs> In our uh, April General Conference, I really appreciated the showing that interview, of President Nelson with some uh, uh, young primary children, and they asked him a question. They said, is it hard to be a prophet? Are you like really busy? President Nelson says, of course it's hard. Everything to do with becoming more like the savior is difficult. So the answer is yes, Pearl, it takes effort. A lot of hard work, a lot of study, and there's never an end. That's good. That's good because we're always progressing, even in the next life. Science is that way. If it's worth doing, there's some effort. But science is boring. I have a hard time sympathizing with this point of view. But homeschoolers of all people should not be saying science is boring because if it's boring, whose fault is that? Homeschool science is as fun as you make it. On this page here, I've got a collage of pictures from picked out of our uh, last 10 years of homeschool science experiments at home. Uh, see in the upper right hand corner in, ex in an electrolysis experiment going on where we're sending electricity through water and uh, creating hydrogen and oxygen and also depositing a, a, an electroplating on this plate of copper. Right here, I don't know if we ever were able to, to, to identify this microorganism that we found from uh, the water from nearby, um, uh, from the nearby uh, lake, but it, it was fascinating. And this is a picture, a uh, close picture of a, of a larva head, a fly larva head, most likely, uh, pig dissecting, uh, dissecting a sheep's heart, making batteries out of potatoes and lemons, doing all sorts of chemistry experiments, dipping things in hot water and cold water and seeing what happens. Homeschool science is a blast. By the way, this is my daughter, Melody. She's setting off a balloon full of propane, but we don't do it redneck style. We do it scientifically. We actually measured the precise amount of propane in the balloon. We've, we wrote out the chemical equation. We calculated exactly how much energy, how many joules of energy would be liberated by the combustion of the balloon, and then we liberated it. It was a total blast. Be careful, not just with flames, but be careful with science. There's two major kinds of science that you need to be aware of. There is humble science, and there is toxic science, and I will explain the difference. Toxic science teaches some things it teaches that there's no intelligent design in nature. It teaches that there's no purpose or plan in nature. And it teaches that there cannot be any scientific evidence for God. One of the things that's so toxic about this type of science is it presupposes some things and then it closes eyes to the evidence that's all around us. All things are a testimony that God exists. So if you have blinders on when you're doing science, you're doing it wrong. Humble science, it accepts truth from any source. Humble science follows the data wherever it leads without being limited by preconceived notions. Humble science realizes its own limitations, realizes it can be wrong, realizes it needs to be corrected, and is willing to change its mind when more data becomes available. And I've done that. I used to be very skeptical about the existence of black holes until back in 2016, we had some st astonishing um, new data come in from gravity wave detectors, uh, which uh, persuaded me that, yeah, black holes probably do exist. Pretty big ones too. 
I want to give some examples of humble science and humble scientists. Um, this, uh, I, I watched a YouTube video. It's about 36 minute long, minutes long, highly recommended by Dr. Kim Woo Ju, who is on the front lines in Korea fighting against COVID-19. He's a leader there. He taught you have to be humble. That is science. If you aren't humble, you will lose. Dr. Kim Woo Ju said, but we have to be humble until the very end. And that is so true. So I hold him up as an example of humble science. Gunther Beckley. Gunther Beckley is a German paleo entomologist who specializes in the fossil history and systematics of insects, especially dragonflies. That man knows his prehistoric dragonflies so well that when a famous uh, specimen collector, fossil collector in England, posted this picture online that you see here, he instantly knew that that was a species of dragonfly that no one ever had identified before. And so because he's the scientist who first identified it and pointed out that it was brand new, at least as far as we knew about, he got to name it. That's one of the privileges of, of scientists to discover things. But what's special about Gunther is that at first he was over the top, all in for Darwinism. In fact, so much so that they put him in charge of Germany's, or this particular institution in Germany, their celebration of Darwin's 200th birthday in 2009. And so he did a presentation for this. He, he, did, a, he, did, a visual, he did a visual display. And on this visual display, you see some slides. You see some, excuse me, you see a balance scale. And in this balance scale, you see on the left, some books. And these are all books written by intelligent design advocates, giving the scientific case for uh, intelligent design in nature. And on the right, you see Darwin's origin of the species. And so he, he kind of tipped the scales and said, well, Darwin's origin of species, it, it outweighs all of these other books put together. But then Gunther made a critical mistake, one that altered his career forever. He actually read the books on the left-hand side of the scale, the ones that talk about intelligent design. And once he did that, he realized, wow, this actually makes sense. They have a logical, rational case for intelligent design. And the more he investigated, he realized that that was the explanation that better fits the data. And so he defected from Darwinism and eventually had to quit his job. Fortunately, he has another job now. He is continuing to study fossils. Professor Jay Weil, one of my favorite people ever, one of my favorite scientists. This is a picture of Dr. Weil and I at our uh, 2015 LDSHE conference in Williamsburg. Um, we've used his textbooks. He, he wrote several uh, science textbooks for homeschoolers and they're really well written because unlike most textbooks, they don't assume you already know the subject. So you can pick up one of his textbooks not knowing the subject and just start reading and you'll learn and you'll learn all the basics about it. And I really enjoyed using his textbooks with our children. Dr. Weil used to be an atheist, but he explains that the more he studied science, the more he realized atheism could not be true. And he says, as a scientist, it is hard for me to fathom anyone who has scientific training and does not believe in God. The natural world, in my opinion, screams out his existence to anyone who examines it, even in a cursory way. Indeed, it was science that brought me not only to belief in God, but also to faith in Christianity. And there's an example of a humble scientist. He's a nuclear scientist, by the way, following the data wherever it leads. Um, this is an example from my boss, Alessandro. Alessandro Molina, he is a world-class software engineer, but he had a chance to train the research and development team for a world-class Formula One racing team, the Ferrari team in his native country of Italy, because they were humble enough to realize that even though they're mechanical engineers, they have something to learn from software engineers. In this case, it's an agile development technique called Scrum that allows uh, engineers to make changes more quickly and uh, um, improve their designs more quickly. This is important because during the development of a Formula One racing car, the team will ship 100 changes per week and test them out on the track, shaving every last millisecond off their lap time. 
This is an example of humble science being willing to constantly change and correct and to accept truth from any source. Now that I've been talking about some humble scientists, I'd like to talk to you about teenage scientists. Now this picture here is Philo Farnsworth and no, he's not a teenager in this picture, but while he was a teenager, he invented what later became television. He was the one who first came up with the design of an all electronic television. Lots of people were working on uh, television back in the early 1920s, but they were barking up the wrong tree using mechanical devices, spinning wheels with mirrors on them and such. But he was the first to come up with an all electronic device. He invented the, 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 the television tube. And this came up to a patent battle or, uh, with uh, RCA and in court, he had to prove that he came up with this idea first before they did. And the person who testified on the stand that yes, he was the one who came up with it first was his high school science teacher who said, yes, he explained this idea to me back when he was in my science class in high school. Another teenage scientist, Taylor Wilson. Taylor Wilson is one of only very few people in the world who has ever made a working nuclear fusion reactor. And he's made his first one at age 14. His, his mom and dad are amazed. They are not scientists, but they are supporters of a scientist. And uh, I'm just cheering for Taylor Wilson, wondering what he'll do with his, the rest of his career. Another teenage uh, scientist, uh, earlier this year, January of this year, Wolf Kukier, a high school student working closely with NASA astrophysicist discovered a new exoplanet. Now what's an exoplanet? An exoplanet is a planet orbiting around another star. In this case, this one's very special. It's orbiting around a pair of two stars, one of very few exoplanets that have been discovered in that category. And he did that by doing a lot of careful data, data analysis of uh, telescope images. I hope that these teenage science stories come across as inspiring. Um, I really feel like it's important for us to encourage our youth in their creative endeavors and in their scientific uh, activities because you don't know where they're going to go and, and where it will lead. I'm very grateful for my parents and for the encouragement they gave me when I was young. So I wanna tell you my story. And my story, I think a good scripture uh, theme for my story would be from uh, Matthew chapter six, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I feel like in my life, whenever I've sought after God and tried to do what he wanted, he has opened up amazing opportunities for me. Started out with my parents. This is a picture of my father, Roger, in the 1970s. He's working at a company called Tektronics. They were famous for making oscilloscopes, which are uh, very specialized electronic instruments for dis uh, displaying uh, waveforms of electronic signals. And you see him here working on a very early model computer. I think it's the Tektronix 4051. Um, and uh, he understood technology and he helped guide me in the right path. When I was 12 years old, I um, went to my dad and said, I need to do a science project for school. And I'm thinking of making a radio controlled car or something electronic. And he said, don't do that learn to program a computer. And this is 1979, nobody had home computers at home. And back then, teenagers learning computer programming was unheard of, but he said, no, you can do it. And he took me to work with them after hours so that I could get on the computers at work and that's where I learned to program. And then later on, when I was about 16 or 17, my dad bought one of the very first IBM PC computers ever made and brought it home and I learned to program that. And that's what got me my first programming job at age 18 with a company called Papa Aldo's Pizza. Um, they've since merged with uh, Murphy's Pizza and Papa Aldo's uh, Pizza merged to become Papa Murphy's Pizza. But I was working for their head corporate office writing food cost analysis software to help them in their business decision making uh, while I was a senior in high school. 
all of this computer programming I did as a teenager really helped me later as an engineering student at BYU. It really cemented in math. You know, studies have shown that you retain, you remember and understand and are able to use things that you learn a whole lot better if you review it and use it right after you learned it. So while most students in school were like say learning algebra and then immediately forgetting it or learning a little bit of calculus and then immediately forgetting it, I would learn some algebra or geometry or whatever. And then I'd immediately write a computer program uh, that was a computer game, but because I'm animating things, I needed math to make it work. And because I was reinforcing the math that I just immediately had learned, it sunk in my brain. And this helped me out later. Um, I was taking a 400 level electronics class and an electromagnetics class and my calculator died on me. And I still managed to get a, a good grade on the final test um, because just math was really ingrained in me. Um, I have to tell you also that I really, really benefited from being mentored when I was a teenager by other engineers besides my father. Uh, our church's seminary program provides religious instruction for all high school age youth. And uh, each, each uh, high school student in our church is during normal times when we don't have a coronavirus going on, attends uh, daily classes before the regular school uh, studying the scriptures. And these seminary teachers are mostly volunteers who have regular jobs. And my high school seminary teacher that taught me the Old Testament happened to be Glenn Hinton. And this is Glenn Hinton's name on a research paper published by Intel titled Hyperthreading Technology Architecture and Mic Microarchitecture. Glenn Hinton is one of Intel's senior fellows. He's recently retired, but out of their tens of thousands of engineers, he's maybe in their top 150. And he, was my, he taught me computer architecture and how computer chips work as a high school student because he saw I had an interest. That gave me a huge boost later on uh, when I applied for an internship at Intel while I was uh, still an undergraduate student, I was able to take basically a, a phone screening test where the hiring manager asked me all of these questions about computer architecture that normally only a graduate student could answer. But because of what my seminary teacher taught me in high school, I was able to answer those questions, get an internship, much much earlier on, pretty much finance my college and get a huge boost in my career. But for two years, I took a complete break from all math and science and taught the gospel as a missionary in the South Pacific. Um, and when I came back, there were people actually told me, you know what, you're going to have to start over. I had attended, I attended one year of college before my mission. And they said, well, you've forgotten all your math now and you'll have to start over from the, from the ground up. And actually what happened was I went back to school and I got the best grades ever. It was my best academic year ever. As far as math goes in um, multivariable calculus and, and differential equations, I got A's. And I have to give God the glory and the credit. If you serve the government in the military, they, through the GI Bill, They'll give you money to pay for your tuition. But if you serve the Lord, he will enhance your abilities. He'll increase your intelligence. He'll help you in ways that nobody else can. After I graduated from college, I was privileged to work with some of the best engineers in Intel working on the Pentium Pro. That's this chip on the right, which is the precursor to the chips that are in most computers nowadays, in most uh, personal computers. And it was an astonishing and amazing ability that could not have happened with all the ten without all the tender mercies of the Lord that, that led up to that. After a couple of years of working on that, I quit hardware engineering and went into software engineering and uh, continued my career from there. And uh, I've had to retrain myself several times. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Lessons learned. God knows and loves each of us personally. He cares about the details of our lives. Uh, this sign that says that is on the visitor center in the, at the um, Rome, Italy temple. And I saw that I had to take a picture of it because it's so true. 
Speaking of being privileged, we live on a privileged planet. There's nothing else like it in the universe. I told you about the search for exoplanets orbiting other stars. Um, these planets have been detected. None of them could support human life because the planet has to be just right. It has to have a stable, nearly circular orbit. It can't be too close to the, to the star. It can't be too far away. It has to be tilted on its axis, but it can't be tilted too far. These are all amazing things. They had to line up for our planet to be a place in which it could support life. I think our astronauts, the, the moon astronauts realized that when the Apollo astronauts who first landed on the moon uh, first orbited the moon and came back around. They did a broadcast on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1968, and they thought it appropriate to read from the first chapter of Genesis, which says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're the we are the beneficiaries of fine tuning. Fine tuning is something that all scientists understand is real, even the atheist ones. If the mass of a proton and the mass of electron didn't have just the right ratio, water molecules could not exist. Life could not exist. Everything has to be just perfect. The physicists refer to this as a Goldilocks universe. Everything lined up just right for life. Think it's a coincidence? I don't think so. Um, let's give an example, another example that I thought of. Have you, has it, have you ever wondered about how the moon appears to be exactly the right size, that it just blocks the sun barely? Not too much, not too little. And the consequences of that for scientific research, because the moon is just the right distance and just the right size, that, enables, that has enabled scientists to study the sun's corona, the part around the sun um, that flares out for millions of miles, but that is not visible uh, normally because of the because of the light the excess light coming from the sun also uh, eclipses uh, solar eclipses were essential in verifying Einstein's theory of relativity uh, back during the 1920s uh, a solar eclipse was used to measure how much starlight is bent by the gravity of the sun as it passes uh, this is not something that's possible to measure except during an eclipse because suns whose positions are near where the s uh, stars whose positions are near where the sun is in the sky cannot be seen except during an eclipse. But they were able to see how much the stars were moved and the movement was ver verified Einstein's equations. I have some advice for parents and youth. Um, in your scientific learning. The first off is seek ye first the kingdom of God. My parents put seminary first, this uh, gospel study program for high school students. I did not want to go at first because guess what? In my area, class started at 6 a.m. So I told my mom and dad, you know what? I don't think I want to go to this. And they said, you know what? You're going to go to this. And I'm so glad they did because that was the uh, uh, important spiritual foundation for my life. And oh, by the way, that's where I met Glenn Hinton, world-class Intel computer architect who got me started on my career. Um, learn to program. I said it before, I'll say it again. The best jobs are gonna go to those who can code in the future because everything's going in that direction and it helps you in everything else. Read nonfiction. And, um, at the end of this presentation, I have a link to a website that I put up that goes along with this presentation. And I have a recommended reading list. It's not huge, it's only five books on it. There's certainly a lot more than five good scientific books. But the point is you have to read nonfiction and it will fill your mind with knowledge. It'll give you context. Reading thick books on scientific topics is going to give you the context you need to understand all the stuff you read on the internet and help you filter the truth from the garbage and there's so much garbage. Find mentors and learn from them. Don't wait to be taught things in school or on the job. Learn things on your own proactively. Uh, I started out my career as a computer chip designer. I'm now doing internet software development. That did not exist when I was in college. Everything I know I've had to train myself, usually on, the, on my own, 
before I can even apply for the job. Do things, create art, write computer programs, build things, build all kinds of things. Uh, one of the things I'll recommend to you is something called Maker Fair. And this is a festival, it's an annual festival held in cities around the world. Uh, big cities like uh, New York City and London ho host these things, but they hold hold uh, smaller what are called mini makers in places like Raleigh. And it's a place where people go to show off things that they made. Back in 2014, uh, we had a science club and we put together a scientific experiment, called it the elevator project and involved the microcontrollers and accelerometers and we brought it and we demoed it at at uh, Maker Fair, and it was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. And last but not least, keep moving forward. Embrace lifelong learning. That's why this, this presentation is not about how you can teach science to your children. It's about how you and your children keep on studying and learning together for the rest of your lives. This book right here is the title is Relativity, the Special and General Theory, a clear explanation that anyone can understand by Albert Einstein. He wrote the first edition back in 1916. The fifth edition came out in 1952. Um, taking him at his word, when I was 11 years old, I checked this book out of my elementary school library. And let's hope your elementary school libraries are like mine. And of course, if you're homeschooling, you control this. I checked this out of my library and I read it, read it for the first time. And I understood maybe 20% of it. But I've read this book six more times. I've literally had it by my bedside for years. Um, I'm not the brightest bulb in the world, but I'm patient and I'm persistent. And I was determined I am going to learn the general theory of relativity or die trying. And I do understand to a great degree, and I'd love to explain it to you all. I wish I could do another presentation about the length of this one, explaining general relativity, why it's so important, why it's so exciting. But I appreciate everything better because I have this background. When I see news releases on scientific topics, I understand them. Keep learning. Keep growing. Don't stop. This link right here is handysoftware.com slash LDSHE slash 2020, um, all lowercase. This is a website that I've put up uh, related to this scientific presentation I've just done. It has a PDF file with my recommended reading list in it and a few other things that I will put up in the next couple of days afterwards. Thank you for this time. I've enjoyed this time with you. I've enjoyed talking about one of my favorite things ever. And I would now like to take any questions from the audience that you might have. And I'm looking at the chat window the Zoom chat window to see if any questions are on the way. There's one that looks like it's just come in on the question and answer, David. David, um, The question is, what's your favorite testimony building science fact? What's my favorite testimony building science fact is the question. Wow. There's so many and that's such a great question. I'd have to say, just the vastness of the universe. When I walk out, when I walk outside, I always look at the stars. In fact, if you ask my wife, like many times, I'll just grab her and pull outside, you, honey, you've got to look at these stars. When I look up at the universe and I just look at the stars, I know there's a God there. I know there's a God there. And 
everything I learned about the vastness of the universe and everything I learned about the tininess of the construction, there would be the other side of it. So one side of testimony building of it would be the vastness of the universe on one side. And the other side would be inside of every cell, these tiny little machines, molecular machines, including little outboard motors and trash compactors and everything you can imagine. Um, all of these things to me witness not only that we have a God, and not only that he's intelligent, but that he's vastly more intelligent than we are. And that humbles me. It really does. So I have a question for you. Um, I have a 10 year old son who wants very much to be a programmer. Um, but a lot of software programming seems that it's maybe just a little bit above him. He's done scratch. Is there anything that you would recommend um, as a good place for him to, to be working on um, in the programming field? So there are uh, lots of good beginning Python. So first off, I would focus on Python. Oh, fun fact, the whole country of Ireland decided that all of their uh, students are going to learn Python. <laughs> they picked that as the programming language of choice. Um, it's becoming really popular among scientists and engineers. Uh, one reason why is because it's easy to learn. Um, but Scratch is easy to learn, but the difference between, between Python and Scratch is when you're done learning Python, you can actually do science with it. Like, for example, the gravity wave detection thing, I downloaded a Python program and the data was able to actually verify the gravity waves. Uh, how cool is that? And I use Python every day in my professional work. So it's like a super user-friendly beginning language, but it's used by professionals every day not a toy. So there's lots of beginning um, Python programming books out there. Some of them designed for absolute beginners. Uh, Google is your friend. Um, this is not a sales pitch, but I am working on revising mine and I do intend to get it back out there someday, but uh, I don't have a date on that. Yeah, I saw your curriculum and thought, oh dang, I, I, wish, <laughs> I wish it were available. Um, so at a future homeschool conference, I may advertise it. How's all right. Going? We'll set you up to be a vendor when you've got it ready. That'd be fun. I, I don't see any other questions that are coming in at this point. Um, so we just want to thank you, David, for being here and for sharing this, for sharing your knowledge and your testimony of science and the importance of it. This has been a, a fabulous presentation and um, has really maybe changed my views a little bit on science um, and hopefully we can make it a little more fun here in our home. I hope so. And I just want to say to any of my uh, science students, my homeschool science students who may have tuned into this, I want to say how much I really love you and I wish you the best of success in your lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you next week at our next Wednesday webinar. Thank right. you. Bye.